It's March 13, 2008, in Colbert's house. His name is Colbert A. Sule Jr., and his birthday is March 12, 1932. The people here is Tara Henry, <laughs> Caitlin Combs, and Colbert Sule. The organization that we are working with is Bubble East High School, and his war and branch of service was the Vietnam War in the United States Air Force. He was ranked as a colonel, and he served in Benoit Air Base. Were you drafted, or did you enlist? Well, I, I guess I would say I enlisted. I went to Air Force ROTC, graduating from Louisiana State University, where I was commissioned as a second lieutenant. Um, why did you join? Because I wanted to fly. Uh, why did you pick the service branch you joined? Well, once again, I wanted to fly. In the Air Force, that's where you fly. Tell me about your boot camp and training experiences. Well, when you go to RO, through ROTC, you go through summer camp. And uh, I went through uh, uh, a camp in Texas. It was very hot, and uh, they really worked us tough and uh, had long, hard days and successfully got through it. Do you remember your instructors? Well, I served 30 years, and I had a lot of instructors, but um, I remember one down at LSU, uh, Captain Fred Club. And, um, how did you get through it? How did I get through what? Boot camp. Like, did you have any strategies to keep yourself motivated? Yeah, my instructor. <laughs> <laughs> what was your instructor like, the one you remember? What did he do? You? Well, he was just a very, he had good leadership, he was outgoing, and you really felt uh, like being associated with him. Which war did you serve in? Vietnam, from June 1968 to June 69. And where were you stationed in Vietnam? Benoit Air Base, Vietnam. It's about uh, 50 miles northeast of Saigon, or what is now Ho Chi Minh City. Do you remember arriving there, and what was it like? Well, I arrived in, uh, in the afternoon. It was hot, dry, and uh, the next morning we got up and they processed us in, and we went down to our squadron and got acclimated, and started training. And what was your job or assignment while you were there? I was a forward air controller flying O2 aircraft. O2 is a two-engine Cessna aircraft. It has an engine in the back that pushes and an engine in the front that pulls. And we were, uh, we used to fly low and slow. Did you fly any planes? I flew in 209 combat missions. And did you see a lot of combat when you were there? 209 missions. <laughs> Since I was there a year, that's uh, two days you'd fly combat and then you'd have a day off. Oh. And were there a lot of casualties in your unit? Uh, there were not too many. Uh, we had some, but I wouldn't say we had heavy casualties. Tell us about some of your most memorable experiences while you were in Vietnam. Oh, one night we were uh, flying a mission up near uh, Tay Minh City. It was a special forces camp, and the Viet Cong, the enemy, was about to overrun it. And uh, the people on the ground said they were in bunkers and just bring everything we in and hit the camp because it was about to be overrun. So that's what we did. We brought in fighters and gunships. And uh, most of the people, uh, our, our forces survived. Were you a prisoner of war? No. No. Um, how many medals or citations were you awarded? In Vietnam? Yeah. Let's see. I was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross, 
the air metal with nine oak leaf clusters. Air Force Presidential Unit Citation, Republic of Vietnam Gallantry Cross with Palm, and Republic of Vietnam Campaign Medal. Um, which one's your favorite? Distinguished Flying Cross. Why? Well, it's the highest honor, and um, it was a, related to a particular mission that we flew. How did you earn most of them? Well, by flying combat missions. Yeah. Okay. What were some of your locations during your experience? Well, I started out, like I said, in Air Force ROTC at LSU. And in the first year I was in the Air Force, I was at Ellington Air Force Base in Houston, Texas, where I met Iris and... Um, and we got married a year later. And then from there, I went to Masawa Air Base, Japan, for several months, and then back to Hickam Air Force Base, Hawaii. We were in Hickam, uh, or in Hawaii, for three years. And then I came to Marietta, Georgia, Dobbins Air Force Base, where I spent four years. And from Dobbins, I went down to, I returned to LSU where I taught ROTC. Following uh, that assignment as an ROTC instructor, I went to Vietnam for a year. And then I came back to McClellan Air Force Base, Sacramento, California, for three years flying WC 135s, a jet aircraft. And from there, we came to Scott Air Force Base, where I was assigned to Headquarters MAC. And after five years here, I went to Alaska for three years in the Alaskan Air Command at Elmendorf Air Base, which is in Anchorage, Alaska. And then we returned to Scott for four more years, from which I retired. Can you describe the geography of the region in which you were stationed? I assume you mean Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, flat jungles all around us. Uh, the town there was Benoit. The base, which was right next to the town, was, of course, Benoit Air Base. Had a lot of rivers, streams. The main crop was rice, and uh, the people were very, the Vietnamese people were very hardworking people. So you said there's a lot of jungles there. Did you see any weird animals? No. I was just wondering. No. We, when you're flying over the jungle, you don't see too many animals. Yeah. There were no elephants with wings. Okay. <laughs> in a combat situation, did the geography of the area play a role in each battle? To some degree. Um, like I said, one night one night we were flying a mission up near Tainan City, and there's a mountain up there called Nui Baden, which means Black Sheep Mountain. And in this mountain, the United States owned the top of it. We had control of the top of the mountain. We had control of the bottom of the mountain, but in the middle was the Viet Cong. And if you got too near the mountain, they were shooting at you, you know, at that altitude. So, you know, in that situation, the geography played some part, but for most parts, Vietnam is pretty flat. Uh, they have some mountainous terrain, but that was up north, and I was down in the central part of the country. Was there anything unique about the region in which you were stationed? Well, we were near Saigon, which was then the capital of South Vietnam, and it's a large uh, city. Um, had rivers going through it and around it. 
rice, a lot of rice farms around it. But uh, other than that, nothing else. Were any of the cities there like the ones that you see today in America? No. They weren't anywhere near as modern as America. Although they were very uh, enjoyable, you know. You had some good restaurants. Uh, instead of a taxi, well, they had taxis, but most of the time you'd catch a rickshaw, which is a little wagon, a buggy-like thing, and they pull you. And that's how you got around. Mm. Did they ride animals? Most, no, not not too much. They uh, they rode an awful lot of bicycles and motorcycles and little scooters, motor scooters. What kind of businesses did they have there for you to look at or shop in? All oh, about the normal thing, uh, food markets, uh, clothing. They'd have nightclubs, bars, cafes, restaurants. You know, it was a typical... Vietnamese city. Yeah. Were the streets really crowded? Very crowded. Okay. How did you stay in touch with your family while you were over in Vietnam? Well, we did it two ways. Letters and uh, through tapes. We would sit down. I had a tape recorder and Iris and the kids had a tape recorder, and we'd sit down and we'd take messages and mail the tape. And over there, uh, if you were stationed in Vietnam, you didn't have to buy any postage stamps. Postage was free. So we'd write a lot of letters and, and make these tapes, and uh, that's the way we communicated. Do you still have some of the tapes? I think if I got up in the attic, I could probably find them, but I'm not sure they would work. Oh, yeah. Because another thing we'd do is we'd recycle the tapes. So, you know, one, if I sent a message to the Iris and the kids, they'd listen to mine, and then they'd record theirs over it and send it back to me. So that erased what I had said. Oh. So there were no telephones there? Yeah, they had telephones, but, you know, it. They were busy for combat missions and all, so we didn't get to use them. Now, I did get to come home after the end of four months. I had two weeks off. And then four months later, I met Iris in uh, Hawaii for R&R, &R, Rest and Recuperation. And we spent a week up on uh, Kauai, which is the flower island of Hawaii. Very pretty, beautiful island. And, of course, we had been stationed there earlier in my career, so we were very familiar with the island. What was the food like in Vietnam? Well, most of it was American um, because being in a combat zone, you seldom ever got off base because the Viet Cong, you never knew who the friend of the enemy was. And so you didn't want to stray off and, and get into a, an area that maybe they controlled and, and um, you know, some, some bad things could happen to you. But Vietnamese food was mainly uh, what you imagine when you go to a Chinese restaurant today. Now, one thing I remember, we, uh, well, probably once a month, We'd get a day or two off together, and we'd go down to Vung Tau, which was uh, on the coast of Vietnam. And it used to be an old French resort city. And you could they had some wonderful French restaurants there, as well as Vietnamese restaurants. So you, you had all kinds of food, but, uh, you know, predominantly we just ate what GIs eat, and, Were there any supplies that were highly valued? Any supplies? Yes. Yeah. Ammunition, guns. Um, you know, the soldiers and the Marines had the toughest part of the war because they were on the ground. And if the Viet Cong, if they were killed, the Viet Cong would take their weapons and their ammunition. Now, being in the Air Force, 
you know, you were flying, and unless you, they hit your airplane, uh, you came home, so nothing happened. But ammunition, I'd say guns and ammunition. So they didn't send you care packages like they do in Iraq today? Oh, you mean the family? Yeah. Oh, yes. They, they send you stuff? Yeah. What did you like the most? What did you like them to send you? Oh, sweets, cake, candy, nuts, canned nuts. About the same thing as that the GIs like today, you know. Mm, how did people entertain themselves? Oh. <laughs> we, uh, most of our missions were at night. So we would fly at night, and in the daytime we'd sleep some, and then we'd go down to the swimming pool, which we call the beach. <laughs> and you'd play, uh, you'd, you'd swim a while, and then we had uh, racquetball courts. We'd go play racquetball, and then come back and swim. And then go back to the uh, where we live, which they called a hooch, and uh, take a nap, and then you'd go fly your mission. Were there any dances? Imitation dance. Our unit was, every unit over there has a call sign. And our unit was nicknamed Sleepy Time because we flew at night. And, and every person over there, like, is given a name and a number. Like I was Sleepy Time 76. You never use a person's name over the radio because the Viet Cong would intercept that and if you were captured, they would use it against you. So anytime anybody wanted to communicate with me when I was flying, I was Sleepy Time 76. And every unit has different names with numbers. And that's, that's how we communicated. Um, we used to play a lot of poker. I remember one night uh, we were, had a poker game going, and I had a real good hand. Our base was under attack a lot at night. The enemy would lob shells in there, mm -hmm. mostly to wake us up if you were trying to get some sleep. But anyway, this one night I had a real good poker hand. It was a big pot and they started shelling. And everybody wanted to go to the bunker. And I said, we're not going to the bunker until we finish this hanging. <laughs> and I won the pot. <laughs> so were there, we learned in our history class that there was a lot of women that visited these camps. Was that true with yours? Well, they were entertainers, you know, like the USO. And in talking about the USO, the saddest time over there during the whole, the whole year you're, you miss your family, but you're busy and time tends to go by. But Christmas was exceptionally sad. And uh, Bob Hope, with his troop of USO people, came in and put on a show at Benoit on Christmas Day. And that kind of lifted the spirits of... And right next to Benoit Air Base was an Army post called Long Ben. And uh, that's where the soldiers operated out. And they would go out in patrols out into the jungle. And so, uh, you know, one we had a jeep. And uh, if you had the day off and you wanted a good Chinese meal, they had a Chinese restaurant over at ben, uh, Long Bend. And we'd drive over there and get Chinese food. That was kind of a big thing to do. <laughs> And then you said there were entertainers who visited the unit, but were there any others besides Bob Hope? Oh, yeah. USO had a bunch of troops, but I don't really recall all of them. He stands out because, you know, he's so famous and he did it so often. Oh, yeah. Um, what did you do when, on, when you were on leave? Did you go home? Well, I said after the four months I came home, and your grandmother, or Iris, stayed in Baton Rouge because, as I said, I taught ROTC there. My parents lived only 20 miles away, and they could help out with the children. So when I got to, to leave, I came home and, and visited the family, and then I went back to Vietnam. And then what are some of the pranks that you or other of the people that you were with, what kind of pranks would you pull on each other? Well, we really didn't pull too many pranks, but uh, I guess 
by making them stay and play poker. You could call that a prank. <laughs> Although I, I won a lot of money. <laughs> were there any really funny or unusual times when you were over there? Yeah, we would have picnics. You know, you'd take your little basket and go out to a tree <laughs> and sit around <laughs> and tell stories. And mm -hmm. uh, Well, one prank we did, we short sheet beds. I don't, do you know about oh. short sheeting beds? No. Well, you, you go in and make them up where when you get in, you short shorted the sheet and they can't get their feet and legs down in the bed. Oh. And they're wondering, you know, you're in the middle of the night, and they're wondering why they can't get in bed. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, did you have any photographs that you would like to share with us? Yes. And what are they pictures of? Oh, I've, all through my career. I can give you pictures from everything. Right. And, you know, talking about that, we lived in a hooch, which was a, that's what we called it. It was a Quonset hut. And we used to put uh, sandbags all around it, so when the Viet Cong would fire the shells in at night, if one hit near us, the shrapnel would go into the sandbags and not hurt anybody in the hooch. And so when we'd fill these sandbags, which you had to do about once a month because it was so hot and humid over there, they would rot. Yeah. We'd call that a beach party, too. <laughs> you know, you'd get out there and you'd be filling sandbags and stacking them up around your hooch, and that was a beach party. <laughs> um, and we called the, we called our little, we had several buildings to house our unit. We called that the resort. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think of officers or your fellow soldiers? Well, I was an officer. You admire them and uh, respect them. Um, each one of them is different. You learn to uh, accept those differences. And uh, you really grow close. Um, a lot of people keep diaries when they're in the war. Did you do that? No, I did not. Just writing letters back and forth, you know, I would tell what we were doing, what was going on, as much as I could. You couldn't tell everything, mm -hmm. but uh, didn't keep them. Were there a lot of secrets that you had to keep during the war, but you couldn't tell anyone where you were stationed? No, we could tell them where we were stationed, but there were things, certain missions and all, you could not talk about. What would happen if you did? Well, you would compromise your unit. You know, you would give the, uh, if the word got out, the enemy would have the advantage Consequently, you could uh, have higher casualties. Did that ever happen? Not to my knowledge. Do you recall the day your service uh, ended? Yes. April 1st, 1986. I retired from the Air Force after 30 years, one month, and 23 days of service. The retirement ceremony was at Scott Air Force Base, Illinois, and uh, we had a big uh, retirement ceremony and then a reception following. What did you do in the days and weeks after you retired? Well, there's an old saying, honeydews, and those are things that your wife wants you to do but you never had time to do. And so we had 30, 30 years of built-up honeydew <laughs> that I had to take care of. What were some of them? Oh, let's see. You caught me on that. Oh, you, you ready? Mm -hmm. Yard work. Um, pack things and put them away especially my uniform, but I didn't need those anymore. Although uh, there were occasions following my retirement in which it was proper to wear your mess dress or your formal uniform, and I would wear it to uh, formal occasions. But uh, 
just kind of doing little things around the house that you seem to overlook. After you retired, did you work or go back to school? No, I worked. Uh, I first worked for the Central United States Earthquake Consortium. It was a consortium of seven states doing earthquake planning. Uh, the states were in the mid Midwest, uh, and uh, we did a lot of earthquake planning, such as, for example, if you were a doctor, they had an earthquake scene in Illinois, and you were a doctor in Missouri. You might want to come over here and help with the, the people that were injured and hurt, but there was no legal means for you to do that. So we worked out a... Uh, an agreement between the seven states that allowed doctors, firefighters, police, uh, first responders, so to speak, to cross state lines and be able to operate without being uh, in fear of being sued. Was Follow there? No, following that, uh, I became the uh, manager for the St. Louis TRW. Uh, that's the name of the company, TRW. I became the manager, district manager of the St. Louis office, and I worked there for nine years. And when they decided to close the office, I retired from that and have been retired, retired since. Was your education uh, supported by the GI Bill? Yes. I, uh, I was assigned to Scott Air Force Base twice. My first assignment here I decided to go back and get a master's degree under the GI Bill. I attended Webster University in St. Louis and got a master's degree in, in management. And what is the GI Bill? GI stands for government issue. And uh, so it's a bill that helps veterans. Or you can be on active duty. You don't necessarily have to be a veteran, but most people that use the GI Bill were veterans to go back and get an education and prepare themselves uh, to become more productive in life. Did you make any close friendships while you were in service in Vietnam? Absolutely. And we still keep up with each other. The one thing in the service is you move around and you have different assignments. You just meet more wonderful people. And... Um, you know, you share your job, you share uh, social activities, you share seeing the children grow up, and uh, you never lose contact with those that really become close to you. And, and there are many that we still keep up with. Did you ever find that when you came back home you were actually really close to one of your friends that you served with? Absolutely. Many of them. Not just one, but plenty. Uh, Little story I'd like to say. The last, in, in Vietnam, in the O2 aircraft, we used to fly about 500 feet off the ground, and it only went about 80 miles an hour. And our job was to spot the enemy, uh, enemy activity, and then we'd bring in gunships, fighters, artillery, whatever we thought was the best uh, weapon to put on them. And uh, one guy I flew with was... Russ Rinklin, and uh, I came back from Vietnam. I flew my last mission in Vietnam with Russ, and I told Russ, I said, tonight, uh, you know, this is my last mission. Let's don't do anything too exciting. So we climbed up to 16,000 feet and just cruised around to make sure I got home safe. <laughs> but anyway, I left Vietnam in June of 69, and I never saw Russ again until... Probably about 1995, we were at a social event in St. Louis, and uh, we were all in our uh, dress uniforms, formal uniforms. Although I was retired, I still wore the formal uniform. And uh, Iris was with me, his wife was with him, and we were about 20 yards apart. And I sighted him, and he sighted me, and we kept eyeing each other, and finally we realized who it was. And so here it was almost 30 years later that we ran into each other. And uh, he was stationed at Scott Air Force Base, and uh, we continued to uh, be good friends with him and play golf. Did 
Did you join a veterans organization? I joined several of them. Uh, I joined the Air Force Association, uh, the National Defense Transportation Association, and then I joined the uh, Retired Officers Association, which is now called the Military Officers Association of America. I became very active in that and uh, served on their national board of directors for six years, served as the second vice chairman of the board, chairman of the membership committee, and am now still very active in uh, local and state activities. And once a year, I go to Washington with them at their request. They invite me to come up, and I lobby Congress for things that uh, are of interest or to retirees and um, active duty military. Another association I joined, LSU is known as the, the Old War School. And it's known for that because of the large number of lieutenants that they commission. And uh, they have an organization down there called the Cadets of the Old War School. And in November of 2007, I was inducted into their Cadets of the Old War School Hall of Fame. And we just had a wonderful weekend. We saw the LSU homecoming game in which we won 58 to 10 and later became national football champions. So I belong to a number of military organizations. Which one would you say would be your favorite to participate in? Uh, military Officers Association of America, because we still participate in that. We have a monthly dinner meeting and speaker, and uh, it starts with a social hour at 6, and then we eat from about 7 to 8.30, and then we have a speaker, and, uh, and you get together with a lot of your old friends and comrades, and you tell war stories, or what we call war lies. <laughs> what speakers do they usually feature? Well, they have all kinds. For example, uh, this month, uh, we had the director of the airport out at Mid America. In Ma uh, February, we had a guy that was a specialist in terrorism and, and intelligence, and that was that was a tremendous speaker. Next month, uh, we're going to have the uh, head basketball coach from McKendree, who has won the most basketball games of, of any active college coach. That's great. So it's a wide variety of speakers, and uh, and we go to different places, you know, different restaurants uh, for the monthly meetings. So we have, we're going to have a good time seeing your old friends and all. What did you go on to do as a career after the war? Well, uh, after the war, let's see, I had been in the service about, 10 or 12 years, so I went on and spent 18 more years in, in active duty in the Air Force. And I left Vietnam, came back to Sacramento, California, flying WC-135s, and from there to Scott Air Force Base, where I became I, a, kind of a desk jockey, and uh, went to Alaska and then back to Scott Air Force Base. So I had three or four assignments following Vietnam uh, until I retired from the Air Force. What was your most exciting assignment? Well, most exciting, I'd say, is Vietnam. Every time you flew a mission, that was an excitement. Um, and I'll never forget one mission we were flying. We supported the Army, and they're on the ground, and we're supposed to, you know, spot the enemy and tell the Army where they are and that gives them an advantage. And one night we got a call from the Army and they said that they had received reports that there was some activity and they gave us coordinates because you never say where you are in names. You use geographic coordinates on a map. We had a special map. And they give you these coordinates and you go up there. Well, we went up there and we just got all kind of fire up at the airplane. Cannons machine guns, everything. And so we scooted out of there and we called the Army back and we told them what we had spotted and what they had fired at us. And they said, well, that confirms our report. 
<laughs> that was a pretty exciting journey that night. Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or the military in general? Well, yes. You can't spend 30 years in something and not be influenced by what you're doing. So uh, I would say it has greatly affected the way I think about things. Uh, one one thing I like to keep in mind, uh, I think Canute Rockney said this, the great football coach from Notre Dame, in which he said there is no substitute for victory. And, and all through your Air Force career, from the time you're a cadet, you know, they're teaching you how to win. And um, so that's what your your life objective is, is to win. But but other influences, you, you learn how to get along with people from all over the world, different backgrounds, different interests, and you learn how to tolerate and, and actually appreciate their beliefs as much as you do your own beliefs. So do you think your beliefs from the time before you went to war to the time after you went to war have changed a lot? No, I don't think so. I, uh, Like I said, you know, from the time I was in ROTC as a cadet, uh, we were taught to win. And, uh, and I still don't like to lose, as you know, in golf. <laughs> Let's see. How have your service and experiences affected your life after you got out of the war? Well, I think they've affected me mostly by the, the people I've met and the friends we've made. Uh, we've, we've made an awful lot of good friends and, and still enjoy meeting and talking with them, visiting, exchanging Christmas cards, pictures of our children, our grandchildren. So it's, I would say it's affecting me in that we want to keep up and know what, what they're doing as much as they want to know what we're doing. And then I've heard of people who have post-depression, I guess it's called, after the war. Was that something that ever affected you? No. no. Okay. What is your best memory of your service in the military? Gee, Caitlin, that's tough to answer. I've got so many good experiences and so many good memories that I don't know of one that stands out any more than another. Um, I never really had a bad assignment. I had some good, better than others. I had some commanding officers that were better than others, but I never really had one that I couldn't get along with or enjoy working for. So that, that's really a hard question without sitting down and, and putting my mind to it. But one, one, one experience or one assignment kind of stands out that I enjoyed. Uh, I went back. I graduated from LSU in ROTC, and I went back and I taught ROTC there. And I enjoyed the interface with the young cadets and the, the girls, the angel flight. And, uh, of course, they, they went to the same hangout joints that we went when I was in college, and so I could build a rapport with them and... And uh, being back at your alma mater, you, you have a much deeper, sincere feeling for what you're doing. And uh, so I would say that was a very enjoyable assignment. And, uh, and as a young officer, uh, I was a captain at the time, we took the cadets in the annual flight on a lot of trips. Uh, Irish would go as a chaperone, and we'd have some other members of the uh, LSU cadre going along, and, and so we'd have some good times with the, uh, the young people. And of course, my mother and father kept your mother and <laughs> her brother and sister, and so we were able to go off and enjoy ourselves. Um, you said you taught ROTC. Were there any students of yours that ever disrespected you or a class clown? Yes, I had a class clown. What was he or she like? His name was Butch Pierce. And Butch came to LSU on a football scholarship. And uh, he was one of the greatest kids you ever wanted to meet. 
but he was he was always getting into mischief. And the class, all of your cadets would go into the classroom, and when you entered the door, they would call attention and stand up. And you would walk in, and then they, you'd tell them to be seated. And you'd commence from there with the class. Well, this one particular day, um, everybody was kind of giggling. They had a big s smile on their face. I didn't think I looked any funnier that day. Hold on. They had a big smile on their face, and I didn't think I looked any funnier that day than I had any other day. So, you know, after this went on for several minutes, I walked around in front of the lectern, and there was a Playboy picture <laughs> and that Butch had put up there. And so I asked the class who had done this, and no one would confess, and so I said, well, everyone will get 30 demerits, which meant they had to march on Saturday. And so finally Butch stood up and confessed that he had done it. But uh, <laughs> he was always doing little pranks like that, and, but nothing malicious or anything, just, just a mischief kid. So that was how you punished them? Yes, but uh, Charlie McLennan was the coach at LSU. And, of course, at that time, all cadets or all freshmen and sophomores had to take ROTC at LSU. And Coach McClendon let us, told us that if we had any problems with any of his football players, let him know, <laughs> and he would take care of them, as well as what we might want to do. So uh, we had a good rapport with the coaches down there, and, and uh, no problems, you know, other than little things like what Butch was doing. <laughs> yeah. What was your worst memory of your service in the military? I think the day I retired. Although I'd served 30 years, I wasn't ready for retirement. I wanted to keep going. And uh, because I had enjoyed it so much and, uh, and had met so many good people. So if you could go back in time, would you have retired, do you think, at the same time, or would you have waited? Well, retirement is, is a, for what rank you are, you can only serve so many years. A colonel can only serve 30 to 31 years. So you might say I had mandatory retirement. My time was up. And you've got to do this in the service at all ranks, to allow the younger people a way to come up and, and get promoted. And, but like I said, I was uh, I was enjoying it so much I wasn't ready to retire. And is there anything else that you would like to add that we didn't cover in the interview? Well, if you look over on that wall, those two walls, that's what I call I love me wall. And it's got all pictures and memorabilia of when I was in service, different locations, and, and you put it up and you can just look at each one of them and you can come up with a certain memory or, or something that occurred during that assignment. And uh, you'll find most military people have this, and like I said, we call it a I love me wall.